ME basics or understanding how that works. Uh, we're going to use the uh, ATEM Television Studio HD, which is this guy here. So if you guys want to wear, that's the one we were particularly going off of. We also have a GoPro shot that I'm going to show you real quick uh, to show the Hannibal switcher that I'm using as well. Uh, and this switcher, just to give you a reference, when I talk about things, if we need it, uh, obviously you got preview and program. There's the color systems here, auto cut, uh, the T-bar, mix types, uh, auxes and everything. This is a universal kind of layout that this guy has as well, and as well as the GUI system for the uh, ATEM, which we'll go over in, in more detail and talk about that. Um, this is an informal class, which is why I do it through Zoom. The reason is that it, I say that is that if you guys have any questions for me as I'm going, please don't hesitate to stop me. Ask me, I'll answer to the best of my abilities. I do not claim to know everything. This is not sponsored by anybody other than Media Stage. Uh, Black Magic doesn't uh, endorse this in any shape or form. Uh, we'll be going over five primary modules, and then at the end, we'll do a little fun facts, kind of go over some scenarios and some questions I have for you guys, uh, and as well as I give you guys a chance to open up and ask me anything that I, I didn't go in depth to. But I will say, uh, each module I do stop, I give you guys a second to, to, to talk back to me, um, ask me any questions that you think I didn't dive into as much, if, if, uh, if we need the opportunity to do that. Um, but again, there are five modules we'll go through. Uh, I see some repeat guys, so apparently I did a good job on the first session, so thanks for coming back on this. Um, and then, like I said, at the end, we'll do a, a fun facts thing, which me just talking to you and kind of asking questions. The second half is being recorded, so we, this will be broadcast to some of our viewers who are, are not, unable to attend right now. Uh, I've gotten a lot of messages between the 10 o'clock and th this one about people who aren't able to make it. I do see one name pop up right now who uh, was on the iffy side, and I see that they made it, so that's awesome. I'm glad you can be here with us. Um, but again, I'm going to give you guys a few more minutes. Let a couple more stragglers come in. I'll get myself a little bit more prepared here. Uh, until then, if you guys have any questions for me in general, or you guys want to just talk amongst yourselves and, and let me know how, you're, how you guys have been doing during quarantine, what other classes have you done? Did anybody like myself just leave Analog Ways, <laughs> or not Analog Ways, the, the Aquaman class from Evolve just now to, to be a part of this one? Thank you for being here. If you guys weren't aware of that, that's an awesome class. They're talking about the LEDs and how you can really push that system a little bit further than, than it was meant to. Um, so yeah, I'll leave the floor to you guys for a few minutes. I'm going to go ahead and unmute everybody so you guys can talk amongst yourselves for the time being. Uh, there'll be people coming in as well, and then we'll kind of do a synopsis of what I just talked about, not as in-depth, but more direct. Uh, and again, remember, this is an open forum, which is why I use Zoom and why I do it through here, is so you guys and me can communicate back and forth openly. Uh, I try to make this as, as virtual as possible, but I also want to give you the hands-on experience since I do do this uh, mostly in the, in the real. And what I mean by that is I usually have a multiple of switchers, and I teach you, and we do hands-on, and then I'd have you come and, and go through a setup. And I'd have you uh, with me in the background kind of being a TD, giving calls out and having you switch cues to get used to that button pushing, not just this the information overload. All right, so I'm going to stop talking now. And I'm going to unmute you guys now. So anybody else here has done any training today other than, than this one? Is this like your fifth one today? What else have you guys looked at? Okay, everybody hear me good? Yeah, Omar, um, I actually logged on to some stuff from Midas, but like I said, I'm really interested in, in anything you have on RF that you're going to be doing, especially short stuff. Um, I know you were talking about doing that later on, so definitely can be posted. Yeah, yeah. So we do have a, a audio class possibly coming up with uh, somebody that's here today. Um, I'll let you know as well. I mean, obviously, just follow me on AV Educate, and we will. I'll keep you guys up to date as much as I can on that. So we are going to have some more audio stuff and lighting stuff coming out in the future. Obviously my bread and butter is video, so I uh, focus on that, but. Um, yeah, and then, yeah. and then podcasting cameras, like kind of like, uh, I was telling you that I was looking at the Black Magic in studio, the 4K. Uh -huh. Yes, and, sir. And, and for settings of low budget and stuff like that, um, if you're ever gonna do something that's ideal for podcasting or like any virtual type of production, kind of like what you're doing now, like the ATEM is yep. something I'm interested in. 
Yeah, no, so we could definitely do that. I, I'm actually, as you guys saw, I had a pen in my hand, and I'll show you right here, a pen in my hand. I got a notebook here. These are all my notes that I take, and this is just from today, so. I'll definitely take that note down um, and I'll, I'll touch base with you offline to, to see what I, I can make happen um, and go forward from there. Hey, Omar, this is Chris. Um, we've just uh, purchased a bunch of PTZ optics cameras. Um, we have several uh, ATEM uh, switchers, which we need more training on, but we're taking on a lot more streaming than we've ever done. So anything we can, uh, maybe if there's a class on PTZ cameras and control, yeah, that's actually the first I've, I've been asked that. So I can work on that one. I, I, I immediately have some ideas for that. Uh, just out of curiosity, I'm going to step away from this real fast. Do you guys have the ATAM streamer packet, the, the little streaming box? Did you guys by chance get that? No, we didn't. Uh, we opted to go with, uh, uh, we were looking for Mag Magwell, but they were back ordered. We were able to find some Ajas. Um, guys, how what about VMix? Have you guys looked into VMix at all? I've heard of that. I haven't looked into it that much. Uh, do you know about OBS then? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so we, if you know about OBS, Zoom and we've uh, we've looked into OBS, but we haven't done VMix yet. So yeah, so if you know OBS and you're familiar with that one, think of VMix as, as, as OBS on steroids when it comes to streaming. Okay, if that, that, if that helps you. Yeah, so I mean that that would be something you look at now that you can get your hands on pretty quickly. Um, cool. VMix also has a lot of online tutorials you can look at as well. Um, but I'll make a note of that as well. So I, I have easy cameras and I got streaming services and then I have black magic. Yeah. The, I have the box here. It's not plugged in unfortunately for the streaming side of this. Um, but that, that box is definitely useful. It, it literally just turns your source until it looks like a camera for this, for the computers is what it's really doing. Right. Right. But I made a note of that. Yeah. So I, I can look at that. If you want to touch base with me off, off and just message me directly, I can kind of give you an update on that periodically and see where we're at. Um, that one might be a little bit more tricky because everybody's doing that right now. So I don't know who will be freely wanting to give information, but um, I, you know, I yeah. definitely will give whatever I can to the community and, and give back. Cause <clears throat> like you're seeing right now, these, these are open discussions. So I'll, this comes to a lot of group thinking and getting involved in, this, in these uh, little classes here. Right. So yeah, I appreciate that. Sure. Uh, I will say that there, you know, obviously the black magics do have a PTZ uh, option to control them a little bit. Uh, I'll show you where that is. I don't dive in deep into it, one, because I don't have anything set up for, for it right now. Uh, and two, it's, that's more of an advanced stuff. So I, I am working actually with uh, another gentleman right now for a more advanced a time class since this morning. <laughs> Coincidentally, we had a lot of advanced users who actually also own a times like I do. Um, so I feel a little like I let them down, but they all got, everybody got something out of it and we'll go over some cool things um, with, between Hyperdex and macros that I think usually are helpful and then kind of my workflow when it comes to the a time. Cool, thank you. Yeah, no problem. Anybody else? No, okay. All right guys, so again, my name is Omar Colon. I'm the founder of AV Educate. This is a basic uh, ATAM training class here for everybody. We're gonna go through a, a workflow and what this is is, or what AV Educate is about is getting a stage hand to, to the end, uh, technician point. And then AV Educate itself is for technicians to get to the engineering point. Uh, this class really should be called the ME, uh, uh, ME class. It's really giving you an understanding of the workflow. Uh, there's a couple of people who joined us after I gave this. So I'm going to go real quick, guys, uh, do a quick pan over with the GoPro. Uh, this is a <clears throat> Hannibal, for, uh, Hannibal uh, 4A switcher. What this switcher is, is, is pretty much what you're going to see everywhere in the world, which is called an ME. This and this are the exact same thing here, guys. And we're going to go over this. We're going to go over this a little bit just as a reference point. And we're gonna go over the GUI system and how we do this. But first, I'm gonna go over this in modules. And the module I have to start off with is Ethernet. So the first part I see the most guys struggling with when we're doing setups of this nature or in these rooms is getting this to work, connect, uh, connect and work correctly. So right now, and this doesn't take a lot of time, so I apologize if you know this. If you don't, this would be a good little refresher. What I typically do is if I have this particular switcher with me, all right, what I mean by this switcher is the Tubman Studio. I would go to the menu once I get it on and plugged in. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead, it'll probably start dropping the program source, all right, and then you would thumb through, which you saw that I was there because I just did this one. You're gonna go to settings, and then you hit set, and then you're gonna scroll down to you see IP, and you have IP address, subnet mask, and gateway. And so we can see, or I can tell you that this is 192.168.10.240. 
So that is the IP for this. And my subnet mass is 255.255.255.0. So that off the bat makes me know what this A10 uh, television studio is as far as IP address. Now, what I'd end up doing is once I get, and I do this myself, you're welcome to do it however you like. In my experience, set them both up so that if you have to do an update or a software or anything of that nature, it's already there to go and you're not having to go back now to the storage room or to the, to, the, to the team, the video engineer to figure out, hey, I need this other cable for whatever reason. I always do both of them together. So and what I'm saying is I take the ethernet line, plug it into the computer. I take the USB and I plug it into the computer. I have both of them plugged in at all times. It's my default go-to. It just saves me that hassle for when it does need to be updated or downgraded if I have to. It's already there and it's good to go. If you're not using the computer at all, irrelevant step. But when I'm using the computer, that is a step I have to take. All right, so we're gonna go back to the screen real quick. Uh, you gotta go. To, go ahead. Okay, so we're gonna go ahead and go to the ATAM setup. This one will pop up. If you're connected correctly, you should see a, a little icon pop up. If something is not, you, you'll see nothing. And that lets you know that right there, that first step right there, if you don't see anything, you know there's a signal for problem between the computer and the ATEM, all right? If you do see this part here, you're good to go, you're on the right track, then you continue to move forward. So I'm gonna go to the ATEM icon here, right? And this launches it. Obviously I've already done this, so I'm gonna go in and backtrack real quick, but you'd go to the, this one, connecting, and now you can see this. So. Here's what I want to talk about here. There's a step that I actually bypassed and I apologize for that. If you go to system preferences on the Mac, system preferences, and I try to keep these both up so I can explain this better. Uh, I feel like we'd sometimes get issues with this when it comes to the IP side. And I just want to emphasize. So what I want to show you is that the GUI system itself, right, is 192.168.10.240. That is the GUI system, okay, is the same information that is what, is what my ATEM is showing me, which is 192.168.10.240. All right, and the reason that is is because that's, that's, that system, that program, needs to be talking to the ATEM hardware side of this. So think of it as hardware and interface need to be the same IP address, okay? They need to be the same. Now, what needs to be slightly different is the computer. It needs to be in the same network, but not the same IP address. So on the computer side, I have 192.168.10.230. So I'm within range of my IP. If I did 240, this would not work because I'd be stepping on each other. Okay, so Apple, system preferences, network, manual, and then in manual, you put this in. Now you can see that my subnet mass is 255.255.250. It's the same as over here. I don't have the router down here. I have a gateway down here. 192.168.10.1, which should match exactly over here, which is 192, and I'm looking at right now, 192.168.10.1. So across the board, I'm good to go as far as my IP goes. The reason I emphasize this so much is because I see a lot of guys on the field struggling with IP because they don't truly understand it. And the thing is, is that if I am confident that I did this correctly and it doesn't work, then I know it's cabling. I know it's either the ethernet or the USB or something is wrong and it's why it's not working. So this is me troubleshooting this as I'm going and as I'm doing these steps, these are things I'm thinking about. If this all works out correctly, right? So we're gonna go back. So I've done, I've seen out the box what the, what the switcher do, has for IP. I've now told the computer what I needed to be for IP to, to be on the same network. And I've now told the a Television Studio, the GUI part of this or the interface, the same number as what the hardware is so that they can communicate. And I should be able to hit that icon and then boom, it's all working, it's all talking together. That, that is my first module and I'm gonna take, I'm gonna do a stop here and just ask, does anybody have any questions about that as far as getting your black magic out of the box, turned on, set up, getting it to communicate with the computer and getting the computer's software to communicate with the box. Does anybody have any questions about that before we move on? Cause that is to me the number one part that I see you guys struggling with. And some of it is, is not confidence in their abilities yet or not understanding the IP stuff enough. And I, I, wanna make, I, I wanna make sure that before we move forward, that this is the main part that if you get this, the rest of this will just flow.
So, and the questions we got asked, which I wish I had a keyword that respond better through text message, but so I just got asked, uh, Omar, my Black Magic Nine streamers are referring to 8264, the web presenter, the mini or the mini pro. Uh, Black Magic streamers are referring to the 8264, the web presenter. So Black Magic has a 8264 recorder. The streaming you can do, 8264 because it looks at it as a camera. So what it'll do is that little box, which if you just give me, I apologize, give me one second and I'll show you my box that I'm talking about. So I'm gonna go ahead and go to that GoPro look real quick. All right, so this is the box. It's not on right now, obviously, because I don't have it, but this is the box. This fake plate is an extra piece here, but this allows me to see a signal here. I, I highly recommend if you buy the streamer, you get the face plate because it, it, this, is a, this is a choke point, in my opinion, for signal flow. So if you don't have a way to see reference that this is getting a signal, you're wasting your time. So I have that for that. Now on the back side, what ends up happening is you can have HDMI in, okay? So let me just get down here. HDMI in and SDI in. So you're gonna take your sources, your aux, your programs, you're gonna come in here. You can come out program, you can come out a loop. This is if you're gonna go back into a, a system or to a monitor. HMI loop out to look at, to also see it in the monitor if you don't have that installed. You have your audio ports as well uh, uh, as inputs. Now, USB webcam is what's gonna go into your, into your uh, computer for let's say that OBS program you're using or vMix or whatever it's gonna be. It is now taking this, this essentially switcher, which is an SDI switcher primarily with, with auxes, and now converting that to be what a, with, what a, um, with what the computer wants to see, which is a webcam. All right, and that's what this box does very well, very easily, very seamlessly. Uh, it literally pick it up and it's just called a, a black, I think it's DMD webcam or black design webcam. Uh, I use this for a lot of my streaming. Uh, the last two classes I've done, we've done this with it. Uh, obviously, Media Stage is sponsoring this event here, so we've done it a little bit differently. Um, but this is what I would have been using had I not been here with Media Stage. Uh, so that I think answers your question, AV Trainer. If it doesn't, please let me know and I'll, I'll come back and touch base on that as well, to, again, to the best of my abilities. Uh, the other one I see here is, so no, so correct. The Hannibal do not have that functionality. What I'm speaking to reference to is that when it comes to MEs or switchers in general, broadcast switchers, uh, they have a, a very similar workflow. So one of the things I try to teach with AV Educate when I'm doing these classes is not just the product itself, but the understanding or getting the basic understanding of, of how a switcher works. So obviously when we're talking about the ATAM switcher here in general, right? We're seeing a colored system here for previewing program. If you've never seen this before, if you've never looked at that, the way that looks like either on the GUI side, right, is on the top side over here, you have program, on the bottom side you have preview, right? But you see the color is still the same. Preview is green, program is red. This is all the time. Historically speaking, this is coming from the broadcast side with radios. Um, and again, this is my, my knowledge of what I've been told. How factual it is is a different story, but it, to me it makes sense. Back in the old days when you used to do uh, radio, they used to flip that switch to say on air and on air was red. Um, and when it was off, it would be green. That lets you know that they're in session. There's a break. You can come and talk to the DJ. You can do what you got to do. And once you flip that switch, he's back on air. You need to be quiet and you'd be on the outside looking in. That's where that color's kind of come from. And it's transitioned over to broadcast and it stayed like that way from the analog days till now. Uh, the reason I have the Hannibal is just as a reference to show you that this switcher, even though it doesn't have that preview program function, it is still using that same functionality. It is still preview program. Right, the colors are showing that. When, if I had a source in here and you, hit, you clicked on it, that green one would be blinking to let you know, hey, this is, this is being clicked on, you hit cut. So, so real quick, if you wanna just jump on that, I can go into back to the, to the GoPro and I can show you these similarities down here. All right, so you got, right here you got a cut and an auto. This is gonna be on every board you use. If I go back to the, the live side, you have a cut and an auto. This again is on every board you're gonna use. I go back to the GUI side, and down here you have cut and auto. So there's these fundamental properties on every broadcast switcher, every ME switcher that needs to be across the board. Once you master that understanding that concept, if you think about it in a wireframe in your head, which I do, uh, then when you see those bigger boards, those two MEs, three MEs, or those advanced panels, you're not, you're not overwhelmed by this button pushes. You're just saying, okay, now instead of my auxes, essentially, right? So we can go about this one. If I show you my, my aux is here, these are all my, my aux here, right? These are my auxes here. I have all these aux buttons here that I, I can use, I can utilize. I also have on the ATEM side, I have an aux button right here because I only have one aux, but I have that same button there, it's the same utilization. 
if I go to the GUI side on this side, okay, and I show you the GUI system, I go to the top here, here's my aux, my one aux, the only aux that I have on this switcher. This is universal. Most switches have this. If you're using a Barco PDS902, probably not, but most switches will have this functionality in them. So that's something we'll go over as well in the next module uh, once we get there. So that, that's something that, very good question. I hope I answered that to the best of my abilities. Um, and everybody understands that this class is meant to teach you that, hey, even if I see, and I'll, and I'll give you an example coming back to this one, when you see these boards, preview, program, auxes, or your buses, sometimes it's slightly different, but you see I got key here, the, uh, downstreams, I got my multi-viewer settings here, I got my auxes, my keys. If this was a 2ME, what would look crazy, oh, I have my T-bar, I don't cut. If this was a 2ME, this would just be the same thing repeated on top, right? There'd be another row of buttons up here. It's not that it's more buttons because it's a 2ME, it's, it's one ME and another row of ME banks so that my, my program for ME1, my program ME2 are coming out a different source. Uh, and again, th this is to give you an understanding of that, but, but I had to call this, had I called this ME, <laughs> had I called this ME, uh, you know, ME fundamentals, you wouldn't have came. You, you want to come because of the ATAM. So I, I use a specific product to teach it, but again, I want you to learn, learn how to use every product. And this was the one that I have available to me to use and how we're using it. The Hannibal is a reference, uh, but yes, it does not have those abilities that you're saying. Um, so I hope that covers that a little bit. Uh, I'm also seeing, so the, the last question he's got here that I'm looking at is, should we start out by plugging in the USB to make setup easier? Uh, so here's the, here's the rule on that, and I'd love to hear your guys' feedback on that, so thank you for bringing that up. Uh, this was actually a talk we had in the last call. Um, I set this up both ways. I'm pretty quick to update automatically without asking permission. Not that that is the right thing to do or the wrong thing to do, it's, it's per client. Most of my clients that I work with are okay with that. I do have one client who recommends not to do that at all because he has his stuff set a certain way and he has pre-built racks. And if you update one thing, Something else has to get updated. Same thing with the firmware of the apples that he uses for the Mac minis. Uh, same thing with the tubs and the switchers. He wants to keep everything the same because he knows it's work, it's functioning. There's no reason to update it unless there's a feature that he really wants that's in that update. He'll update it and test it out beforehand. Uh, most time on show sites, don't do it. I did get feedback from guys about them doing updates and totally uh, crashing or, or burning out systems. So again, I, I'm gonna I'd do another pause. I'd love to hear back from you guys real quick. Have you guys experienced anything like that where you did an update um, or you tried to fix a problem because the switcher and the software were one of the right versions and you couldn't work it without, doing one, without dumbing one of the down, dumbing or upgrading one of the other uh, to get them to work. Did you have a situation where that ended up costing you the switcher and something else had to be figured out? Um, or what are your guys' experiences? Do you, do you always ask the client first? Do you, do you just do it on your own? I would love to hear your guys' feedback on that. What do you guys do on your side? All right, got it. So we'll move on then. So you heard my thoughts on that. It can go both ways. I plug it in, I usually do the update. I don't typically ask, that's the way I do things. You know, uh, let me keep going here. All right, so. One last thing I'm gonna add before we get to the next module here, and again, I'll stop to ask questions. Here's a functionality that I like to use uh, that I feel like guys don't know. So if you're a, a USB guy, if you do a lot of ATAM stuff, if you have a client that you use a lot that does ATAM, you can save settings, right? So save as, save the USB drive. If you're constantly using the same gear, if you own your own switcher or your own rack setup, like I do, I own this switcher with, with a bunch of stuff. So I have a, a pre-designated amount of stuff that I use. If you have that functionality and that option, or you have a show that's going to be, you know, two weeks long, or you're on a tour, and you want to always load up to, to, the, to the settings you want, you can load to a thumb drive, which you need to use a computer for, and hit restore, and it'll restore all the settings to whatever it is you want, all right? The other one that's really cool that is if you, if you do this program, and you start off, and you do save startup state, if this program goes down for any reason, It'll auto save to my last start, uh, my last uh, startup state. And what that's saying is, is that unless I hit clear, anytime I, this thing crashes, comes up or goes down or anything like that, or anybody switches it or closes it in and out, 
this will come back to exactly where I left off and it'll save that settings inside the computer. Um, that's a very cool function that I like that this has. I don't know a lot of other switches that have that option. Um, so I do like to review that. Also, just so you know, this is an XML file. If you do save it to a thumb drive, it'll be an, an XML file. Um, so before I get on to the next section, which would be the switcher settings, uh, does anybody have any questions about that part right there? No? Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and bring you back here. So once, once I'm in a room, right, and I have the switcher set up, the hardware side set up, the software side set up, I've got everything connecting and talking to each other. What I'm gonna look for next is I'm gonna look at my, my cog wheel down here, okay? I'm gonna hit that and I'm going to look at my general, my general tab right here. The reason is that I wanna see the video standard that we're using. So we're using 1080p at 5994. Here's all of my broadcast standards here, 1080, 720, uh, you know, 625 per PAL, NTSC. These are, the, these are what Blackmagic wants to see at all times. So 1080p at 5994 or 1080i at 5994, not 1080p at 30 or 1080p at 60, but 5994. This is very specific to Blackmagic. Uh, your your multi-viewer will show up, your cables can be plugged in, you can be sending a signal. If you're not matching resolution-wise, you are not gonna see that at all. All right. You can change your multi-view to a different resolution if the monitor they're giving you is, let's say, an ASUS or, or, or uh, AOL or EOL, whatever it's called, or, or an ION, one of those cheaper ones. They, they can't really handle what you're sending it to. You can separate that and switch them out to be independent of each other. I try to keep it the same. That's what I do personally. The next part here is SDI is set 3G SDI output to for level A, level B. That refers to mainly or mostly uh, cameras when it comes to black and tri-burst that has evolved over the years to include more things. For me, usually leaving at level B has worked for most times if I'm doing bigger shows or I have a much more elaborate setup, uh, I will change to uh, level A. Uh, I have seen a difference between Christie projectors in particular where I've had to sw switch my outputs to level A to work uh, more effectively. Uh, so there's something to be said about that. But again, depending on the cables you're using, the types you're using, that's really what the factor is. And, and that's for a more advanced class or a different conversation. But those are what those settings are for. We won't dive into the media pool. We, we won't dive into the camera controls. Um, again, we only have an hour. So this is a fundamentals class. We won't dive too much into audio. I will say that audio follows video. If you think about normal, think about normal as, you know, once you switch between input one and input two, you're going to do a hard cut between those two. If you do transition, if you do transition, what's going to end up happening is you're going to do a, a, a gradient. So if you do transition, let's say you're on one, it's going to drop down on one. And as it gets to that, let's say we're doing eight frames, that midway point will be killed. And then you're going to, you're going to radiant back up on the other one. So that's when you do a transition for audio. If you're doing audio internally, you definitely want to use that option. Uh, what I will say is if you are doing audio inside of your system here, if you look at the controller, you can see that this LED lights above it are VU meters. And these meters will, will reflect. They will reflect when, you're, when, you're, when they're in use. Also, you have on and off functionalities up here. Again, we won't talk about that too much. That's for a different class. I feel like most of the operators who will touch this, 95% of the time will never use that functionality. So we won't go into it too much here. I uh, won't go into talk back because that's again for when you're using black magic cameras, mixed minus settings again when you get in socks. I do have some fun facts to go over this though at the end of the class that we'll go over. Uh, next one on the settings is the multi viewer. Uh, this is the default you'll get multi viewer wise, and you can see a little VU meter here. This is the default. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you for that. So, this is settings for we were here, then a multi view. So, on multi viewer, this is the default you're going to get here. You can deactivate or activate the VU meter, deactivate or activate a raster box. You can change your cameras here. I'm sorry, your inputs, you can change your inputs to anything. So my, my input one button could be actually my color bars or it can be my input whatever. Uh, and we'll go into how to change those on the next page. If you're doing a two ME setup, okay, for me personally, I like using these two. So ME one would be probably here, ME two would be like this. And that way for me, what I end up having is, I end up having PV program for ME one here, with all my, all my inputs and then preview program for me to here with all my inputs over here. And what that's really doing for me is it's letting me see what I'm, what I'm sending out quickly right in front of my face. And on the peripherals, what it's doing is it's letting me see those inputs without them being at the bottom and having eight and eight and it looked like one just master row. And I'm having to look 
one way dedicated here and one way dedicated here to see what I'm sending to which one. For me, when I have two monitors, it just looks cleaner to me. That's a preference of mine. You know, that's how I do things. Uh, but you will default to this. If you have a one ME, that's your default. If you have a two ME and you haven't tried this before, I recommend giving it a shot. It's a little trick I do that's worked for me very well. Um, I've almost never had to be like, oh shit, I was looking at the wrong ME board and I hit the wrong one. All right, so labels. So we're gonna go ahead and do labels here. If you look at HDMI one, and actually if you look at it over here too, on the input side, we're gonna change this to MSI. MSI. And we're gonna say camera is called media stage. So on my multi viewer, since I have long form on, I'll see media stage on the multi viewer. Right, save here. And now you can see that my, my one changed to MSI. So I've relabeled that input map. And what that is essentially is taking that, again, taking that virtual realm where you put a label tape on something and putting it in the system so you can see it virtually. Not to say that I still wouldn't do the label tape because I would, but that's kind of where that, that uh, process comes from. Okay. You can do the same thing on the output side and on the media side. We're going to touch on the media side a little bit, but we won't get into too much here. Hyperdex, I won't get on this too much as well on this talk. Well, we did do some talks about it in the last, the last class we did. Um, if you have a Hyperdex studio, this is Black Magic's way of, of kind of making their, again, this is not a uh, Black Magic class or funded by Black Magic anyway. What I will say is that Hyperdex studios, and if you have a mini one, are great resources. And, I'll, and actually, I'm gonna show this real quick to you guys. So I own one, and I left this out from the last class. The five again real quick. So this is the HyperDeck Mini. And you can see it's got a little SD card. Just put it in here. If you do this correctly, which again, I did a demo of this with a friend of mine and it took us about 40 minutes to kind of talk through the whole process, which is why I, I don't have time for it. But essentially, Ethernet, use a network to connect both your ATEM and your HyperDeck together. You would come the way black magic wants you to do is essentially is use one of your oxes as your program out to come to this guy okay and that way what you can do is according to black magic and their verbiage if you do it this way you can now save okay <laughs> you can now save your program out to a, a media player one or to a stored logo essentially and this will create a file but you have to have it routed correctly through here and routed correctly through the switcher in order to get that functionality uh, and that is, if you guys heard it, they don't do that. That is, they don't do it because this is the, this is the method they've created for themselves to be able to do that. Um, again, that's a $300 switcher. Would you, would you still buy this switcher for an extra $300 if, it's, if it internally would save a logo? Um, apparently Blackmagic is, is telling me, right? A non-Blackmagic is telling me that that's what it takes to do that functionality, plus amongst a, a bunch of other things. Um, so they don't do it internally. The only other way to do that would be to, again, have the set system set up. And on the setup side, go to media player and import these here. And I'll show you how to do that in one of the next modules. But again, if you guys are interested about learning more about the hyperdex and how to set that up and run that so that you have that functionality, we can dive deeper into that in a different class. I just feel, if, again, 95% of the time, a text going to go into a room, they're never gonna have that option. They are more likely to have a computer and a switcher than anything else. So that's why we're, we're reviewing that. Um, and then remotes, again, we don't have any PTZ cameras or any cameras hooked up or anything externally, so we won't dive into that as well too much. Um, but we do have works to dive into some of these topics uh, with another instructor uh, down the road. So if you guys are interested in that, in the event page or, or message AV Educate directly and let me know and I can also dive into that and kind of get more direct stuff. Um, but that kind of gets me started for, or set up for the next part. Um, but before I get there, again, I'm gonna stop real quick and you guys just kind of let me know if you have any questions about what we just went over. Again, this is my process when I go into a room of how I set things up and how I go from getting it brand new to myself for my client and getting myself up and ready and going. Uh, these are the things I would do to set up myself, check IP address, make sure it's connected, check my settings. And then from there, I'd have to start wiring things together uh, all my inputs, make sure my inputs are coming in and I'm seeing them on my, my multi-viewer. 
Um, but yeah, so right now, is there any questions about what we just went over here as far as um, what you guys are seeing, what I'm saying? Um, is it resonating with you? Is it, is, do you find anything to be incorrect? Did I not touch on something enough? Uh, do you need more feedback on it? Just let me know real quick. I'll give you a couple seconds to kind of give me a, a response and then we'll go from there. Yeah, so I see one of the other questions we got answered in the comments. Do you updated the unit? Uh, not on racks for the reasons I mentioned. Yep, so you've experienced one of those scenarios as well. I apologize that happens, but it happens. Um, I haven't, so I, I've been fortunate. So I, I, I'll count my blessings now that I'm more aware of uh, these systems crashing so bad. I had, I, I've had a unit arrive where the multiviewer didn't work at all. The, or the multiviewer showed, but no, no, nothing populated to the screens. Um, but the system worked. We could send out, we could bring in, we could auxes work, program work, but the multiviewer fiddly, nothing, nothing popped up on anything except for the multiviewer itself. Uh, and now it's through HDMI, through SDI. It just didn't work. I was going to show I did it in Orlando, and it was, uh, it just, it was killing it. Uh, luckily, I had the switcher here for my client, so it ended up being a, a blessing for me because I got the a bill for it and bring it, bring it in line. All right, so I'm going to carry on. So we've gone over IP so far, we've gone over the settings. At this point, you should be confidently uh, set up in, your, in yourself, you should, or in yourself, in your position. You should have Sydno coming in and uh, you should be working on your outputs at this point. Uh, so one thing I wanna show you real quick is once I get to the output side, if I haven't already ran my cables, what I do on my end, and again, this is, this is my process to eliminate signal flow down the road. I'm gonna hit bars on both preview and program. And what I'm doing that for is that if I acknowledge that I know that my systems are working. I know that I, my multi-viewer is up and I can see something. I know that as well, my inputs are up and I can see them on the multi-viewer. The next step is, the, is now my outputs, if I haven't already done that. If I did that beforehand, it's fine. It doesn't matter the order of inputs or outputs you do it in. But what I do to eliminate a, a step, okay, is I put bars on both preview and program and I send in my aux and I send out my program. And 90% of the times I'm using this particular box, I'm doing aux to DSMs and I'm doing program to projectors. And the reason I send bars out is because that tells me from the switcher to the projector of the DSM, that flow is working, okay? So I immediately know if I send something down the line now and I see it on the multi-viewer and I see it on the other end, that should be 100% fine. If for whatever reason I was waiting for that signal to come in for the input side, I've already tested my output side. I've tested the cables are good, so the signal's going down the line. So I know that that switcher to the endpoint is good to go. And that, that eliminates signal flow for me. So in theory, right, once I get my inputs working and I see them on the multi-viewer, I should immediately see a signal down there and I'll have to double check it again. But that again is just a process I do so that I can real quick get a, a, a visual very quickly on the site of what's going on. And I can uh, determine whether cable's the issues or the box is the issue. If, we, if I do these steps in, this, in these orders, or at least these processes, right, these microprocesses in an order, um, that eliminates me from having to double check my signal flow over and over again. So for example, if you just start plugging in inputs and start plugging in outputs and then start testing everything last minute, I have now introduced two steps to my process. Is my output working now? Cause I never checked it. Is my input going in? Cause I haven't checked it. If I get the signal to work here and it doesn't output, is the signal running there working or not? I haven't checked it yet. Cause I never sent the bars out. So all the bar does, it tells me that from the box on the output side to the end, I have a source coming in clear as day, all right? If you're using other switchers when you have resolutions problems, that, that happens, right? But if I know that my aux is gonna send out, my bars are sent out on, on, all, on all spectrums, and my source comes in, I see it, and now it's not sending out, my, my source, my problem probably isn't signal flow, it's probably something on the monitor end, right? Or maybe something that's on signal-wise that needs to get changed resolution-wise, but not cable-wise, because I saw that it worked. All right, so these are the, my processes to get to that point, and this is part of the switcher settings module. All right, so, we kind of went over video standards. Uh, I'm gonna to touch on the multi-view we went over, the labels we went over, sorry, and the hyperdates we went over. So on switching panels, we're gonna to touch on this a little bit and I'm gonna start giving you now that comparison between what you're seeing on the ATEM, on the Hanaba, and on the screen here. So again, we're gonna jump back to the GoPro real quick. I'm just gonna check my battery levels real fast. Okay, so I'm gonna go five here. So like I was saying, if you look at my, my screen here, right, which I'll actually just do it this way. You see here, I have program, eight channels, because that's how, much, how many inputs, outputs my board has. 
and preview eight channels. And I can go preview and program. All right. Now, unfortunately, I can't do it on, on the Hannibal, but either way, I'm going to take it to the GoPro because I'm using it. But you can see I have preview and I have program. My Hannibal has more, more inputs and outputs represented here. So I, I know off the bat without having to look at the, the I.O. of this board that I have tw up to 12 inputs that I can utilize. All right, because I know that this has eight, right, which is the same as this guy, which has eights. So I know it has eight inputs. I don't know what they are yet, but I know I have eight. And all I've done is look at the front of this board and I have 12 here. All right, preview program, preview program, and the color system here, preview program. So universally the same thing across the board. When you get the bigger switchers, it'll be the same, same thing. All right, so then we'll, we'll go forward. So now we have black, black here, black here, bars and bars, okay? I have the same thing here. <clears throat> I have black here and I have bars here. I have black here and I have bars here. Oh, let me just get you out of this. All right. Again, we'll come back here. You have media player one, media player two. Okay. And you have a T bar. So we'll just go over the transition. You have media player one, media player two. You have colors. We'll go over how to get into that in a minute. And you have transition styles. Okay. You have preview transition, which we'll dive into deeper in just a second. And then you have cut, auto, and rate, which is cool because you could change it right here. Now, come back to five, okay? We talked about cut and auto, which we have here. My rate, I gotta do in the menus, but I know this has it because all, all enemies have it, all right? My swipe effects, I'd have to go to menus. I can see that I have my effects here. I can change effects here. I can do it down here, transition type, mix and wipe. I only have two options here. On my Blackmagic, I have multiple options. And again, back over here, I don't physically see it here. I know that the switcher does it because the computer tells me it does it. So it's gotta be in the menus, all right? And we won't get too deep into that, but it'll be in the menus. So that's what I'm talking about when I'm talking about the fundamentals of switching. These are all the same thing. Everything's either slightly worded differently or in a different position, but they, they, they all use this, this um, same fundamental principles. And once you get those things and you see them, this all becomes very easy to, to understand. Um, so before I continue on to the next part of this, does anybody have any questions about that? No? Okay, so we're gonna continue on. The last thing we're gonna go over real quick here is palettes, media players, and outputs. And we're gonna go over this pretty quickly. Again, if you guys wanna provide feedback, you're more than welcome to. If not, we'll carry on through. We are about 15 minutes out or 20 minutes out, so we're doing great on timing here. Uh, and again, if I'm not answering anything, you can message me privately after the class. You can talk to me in here, talk to me through the chats, and I'll, you know, I'll dive more into that as best as I can. So the first thing I go to is when you go to palettes, you got color generator. We won't talk about too much about the color generator, but you got color one. Oops, sorry. We're talking about the palette, which is over here. All right, color one and color two. Same thing as color one and color two over here. And remember this whole panel here, this program panel is the same as your preview panel because this is, this is a, a ME switcher, not an ADB switcher, but an ME switcher. And you got color one, color two. You can manipulate those colors here. So I'll go to color one. And let's say I want to do purple. Add a new purple, clean, uh, change the saturation of that a little bit. Uh, I want to add some, make it a little bit luminous levels, the dark. You can change the settings here. This is where the color generator is. This is where it's at, it's how to use it. We won't get into upstream or downstream. I don't have anything plugged in to really go into this. This would be more advanced stuff. Uh, again, the reason I say that is because 90% of the people are, gonna use, are not gonna utilize this functionality. Transitions, the same thing as on your board, mix, dip, wipe, and DVE. Mix, you can change your rate here, you can change your rate here. You can also do it in here in the menu, in settings. So you click on menu. Oh, sorry, you can see that I'm still on color one for the, uh, I'm sorry, color two for the program. But you can see in here in the menus and you can change it in here. All right. You got downstream keys, which again, we won't get into because I have nothing plugged in to really play with that. And fade to black. This is your oh shit button. 
And you change, again, you can change that right here. All right, the media player. So if you had this connected to a HyperDeck, you could have a media player, or you can do this another way, which we'll, we'll get into right now. Here's your HyperDeck, which we had on phone plugged in. Media players, so we're gonna do. So there's two ways to do media player, all right? This is the way I do it. 95% of you who are doing a gig are gonna do it this way, or should do it this way, it's just quick and effective. This stills on one, media player one. We'll take the LEC, Live Event Coalition, and put them on media player two. All right, and that is, that is one and two. Now, if I go back to my switcher, and I go to media player one, on program, let's go ahead and send it to program. I can double check over here on my menu side that my program is sending out media player one. And just to test out, I'll go to media player two on program, media player two. And now you can see, if you're looking at it, media player one is green because it's in my preview window. Media player two is red because it's in my program window. And in fact, it, Again, I'll go back to the switcher on the computer side. I'm gonna change to MSI, which is input one on pre preview. And it is changed. If I wanna to go to color on the program, go to color one, change to color two. So this is a good visual to see, hey, is my program sending out what I think my program is sending out? Which the answer is yes. <clears throat> if I wanna change an aux, I can hit on aux, right? My aux is sending out what? It's sending out media player one. <clears throat> now, and I can check that if I come over here and go to auxiliary, media player one. All right, so that's my media side there. And that's how you input. You can also do it the other way, which is go to your hard drive, go to your systems, go to your library, or wherever you store it on your system and input from there. Obviously no explanation needed. You can only upload 20 of these. You can switch between these. You can see a still here if it's imported correctly or not. And that's worked on that. So any questions about what we've gone through so far as far as it comes to media and bringing it up, playing it back between the software side and between the hardware side. All right, so we'll move on. The last one is output, all right? So you can download from Blackmagic Design the design desktop video. I'm sorry, the Blackmagic Design desktop, desktop video, which is a little file that'll capture internally to your computer. What this used to be, which is kind of legacy now, is a lot of the original ATAMs used to come out with a USB out. So you can essentially go USB to something outward. Um, that's not really a functionality anymore, but they have it in there still because they have a software that still works in that mentality. All right, and then time code generators for when you have cameras. I'll say a free run here because I have nothing plugged in. Uh, and then you have time of day. Uh, I leave this on free run. Most Black Magics, at least the last three models, have internal syncing. So they'll internally sync your cameras regardless. Uh, if you're using Blackmagic or any type of camera, it has an internal sync for cameras. So you shouldn't see any glitches like that. Uh, you will get some glitches on, or some gremlins. If you're doing camera stuff and you're doing, um, you know, out input five from camera and then feeding it back in, there's some glitches like that when they're on and off. Uh, we won't dive into that too much as well, but there's things to do there. So there's a time code generator if you want to utilize it with the audio side of it. Uh, but most of these uh, black mind designs will uh, internally uh, frame sync everything for you. Okay. All right, so now we're getting close to that last, we got 10 more minutes left, which is perfect timing. Uh, so a couple of fun facts here that I don't know if anybody knows about. What's really cool about these eight times and my, my eight time in particular, so if you didn't know, if you have this ATEM, the ATEM Television Studio HD, this particular model, which is the baby of them, right? If you have this ATEM and uh, one, e, one, e, one ME ATEM or any ATEM in general, the controller itself, 
and a tub, if you come out of this ATEM first, okay, through the Ethernet port, if you came out of this ATEM first, okay, Ethernet to the next ATEM, the controller, and then out of that to your last ATEM or the, or the brains of this, this will act as an ME. If you didn't know that, it's in the manuals. It's a whole section on it. It's very cool. Uh, so you can essentially use two of these together. Now, I had not tried that with two ATEM, these ATEM, uh, these ATEMs particularly. Um, I need to demo this to get more accurate of it. But for this to an advanced ME panel, to a two ME, I know it works. Um, so there's that option if you have these that you can help anybody who has another system kind of of the ante on what it can do. So that's a very cool fun fact that I wanted to give out to everybody here that's, that's listening. This particular one, the thousand dollar one, can be not daisy chained together, but put in line as another ME to be used in, in that fashion, as long as you, you network it correctly. All right. And then another fun fact is when you have these ATEMs, what Blackmagic allows you to do is if, if you have a router in place, so you come out of this, go to a router, router to your system, and into multiple computers, you can have you can have someone program, someone controlling through the ATEM software, this page, the switcher page, okay? Someone controlling only the media page, another person controlling the audio page, and another person controlling the cameras. So if you have a Blackmagic full studio and you have a camera operator and you have a camera shader guy, he can be off the same box as, as you and me and be in the camera tab without affecting the other, the other, the other two, three down here. Let's say you have an audio engineer and you're doing all the audio through the Blackmagic software. You're doing it through the switchers, through the systems. You're using the audio through the cameras. You can have someone sitting there monitoring audio through the same box, the same IP addresses on the audio side. Same thing with media. Let's say you have a big show and you have multiple cues, multiple ins and outs, multiple images. Not PowerPoints, but images and GIFs, or not GIFs, images and JPEGs that you want to throw through here uh, and some smaller size files, uh, video files. You can throw them in here. I mean, it'll be that content. Make sure it's ready to go so that when the switcher guy needs them, he's saying, hey, get me X, Y, Z ready to go. Boom, it's ready to go. Uh, and as well, you can have somebody who's on a computer doing a switcher. So that's a very cool feature that uh, Blackmagic has that I don't see a lot of people uh, using to, to its fullest ability. I, I see most of you guys, you plug in the hardware, you plug in the hardware, you plug in the switcher, or the, I'm sorry, the computer, and you kind of do everything yourself, which is great. You're a badass for it. But just so you know, with a router and cover with our cables and some computers, you can have multiple people plugged into that ATEM software. So it can be not only this, this piece of hardware, but the whole line of ATEM does this, all the way up to the their new advanced ATEM, which does the four MEs. You can have multiple people connected to the computer side of this, right? And controlling different parts of that. So you can be controlling the switcher part of it. You can still have somebody with the, with the actual physical console and someone also controlling the media side of this and the audio side of this and the camera side of this if you're using a full Blackmagic distribution channel. Um, that's one of the fun facts for that. We did get a lot of talk about uh, Hyperdex. I kind of dove into that a little bit for you guys here. If you have any more questions, let me know. Uh, I do know if you also want to leave a comment about it, uh, there has been requests to do a class on it. Again, I don't feel that 95% or more of the guys that go on Showstar are going to have that option. So I, I kind of don't want to go through that on this one. If that's something in particular, we can do that. Um, post it on our YouTube page and you guys can see that there and we can dive more into that a little bit for the AV side. Okay, and then the last two things I want to review with you guys is macros. If no one knows what macros are, uh, I'm a huge fan of macros. It's not as fun with this switcher because honestly, if I'm using a switcher, I'm probably not gonna ever need it. But if you have a bigger A10 switcher and you need to do more things, uh, you can use the macros. What's very cool about macros as well is that macros can also be uh, saved so you can create smaller uh, transition points and recall those transition points. Uh, and if you are in a point to where, hey, I have a, a, a difficult queue to do and I want to see it before I send it out live, right? You have a preview transition. So you can record multiple steps or do multiple things, hit preview transition and see that action or the, or the transition between one input to another on the preview side before you take it live and do that transaction live. But so anyways, top here next to files, macros, and you click on this, right? And I, and I always drag it over here because I almost never use anything in this window. So I drag this over here all the time. You're gonna go to the create tab 
And again, I'm going to do this like an AB switcher. So you're going to see me randomly do stuff. So I'm going to leave this on MSI, MSI. I do this on MSI and camera two. Okay. I'm going to hit the plus symbol. So you can see I already created some stuff. So actually let me, let me delete these guys. Delete, there we go, plus. All right, I'm gonna call this test. Call this test, I'm gonna hit record. Now, you see this all highlighted red, so this is all being recorded, all my actions here are being recorded. So let's say I was using, I was using this as an AB switcher, all right, and I was using my, my preview, or my aux, my preview as camera four and my program as camera seven, okay? And I just, I just hotkeyed it. I didn't do any transitions, nothing to program. I just hotkeyed it. And my auxiliary, I want to change to media player two. And that's that. So I'm going to change this to MSI one, MSI here, and change auxiliary to media player one. And I want to confirm it again real fast. So I'm going to see my console. I'm seeing media player one here still. All right. Come back to me. So now all I'm going to do is I'm going to hit one Q. Okay. I'm going to hit this test button. You're going to see all my, my stuff change. So test, sorry, you're going to go to run, recall and run and hit test. I hit test, camera, my camera changed to camera seven from one and my preview changed from MSI to camera four. All right. And now I'm going to go back to see my program. Cause I may, remember I changed my auxiliary, right? From one to two. So it's changed. And now in the physical world, it's changed. And that's the essentials of a, of a macro. A macro allows you to change multiple inputs to multiple outputs. Some of the caveats that I will tell you is that when you're doing macros, if you do it the way I did it, these are more like, these are just cuts. Uh, so they're a little more dramatic. I'm a, a big fan of cuts though. A lot of my stuff I, I switching is in cuts. I don't do a lot of transitions. If you want that functionality still, you gotta make sure that you're doing your, your auxiliary and your program uh, out. Uh, when you do your changes to so you change from four and then hit uh, hit cut or auto and then that would do a transition and that would be your save all right so again you go to create i'm going to change this msi1 msi1 go to the plus symbol call this test two again test two I'm going to record that my raster box is up i want to say i want to take four to screens hit auto now four to screens I'm going to hit this and now I've stopped it. I'm going to go to run. I make sure I'm activated on recall and run. If you don't activate this, nothing happens. So recall and run. Hit test. And now my, my transition has happened. So, and all that's happened is my program, right? So I'll change this back here, change this over here. So wherever I am, let's say I'm media player one, I would hit my test two. And now everything's been changed to camera four like I needed it to. And my PV now is on MP41. So, this switcher doesn't do it. Uh, we found that on the morning session, but if you have a 2ME or more complex uh, switcher or the, the next version above, what you can do that's very cool is if you have complex switches, like using a, uh, an ATM 2ME, which, which is where I've used this at. If you're doing something with a 2ME and you have to create a complex switch, you can create smaller micro switches or, or micro transitions and actually record your macros as part of your transition. So I can do, I can create a new one. I can then record or play two of my macros in my recording for my new one and then create that as a final product. So now what ends up happening is, let's say I have a complex set of sequences, instead of me having to mess up and start all over again, I already have like um, A to B switches done already so I can just chain them together, record that chain together. And now I have this bigger, more complex switch between ME1, ME2, pips, keys, lower thirds, whatever the case is, I can have it all preset on a button switch for me. And now it literally becomes a button. So when I do these bigger shows, I can do, I can do, you know, walk in look, presenter one look, presenter two look, presenter three look, you know, whatever, whatever look. Uh, when you're doing multiple screens and things like that, and you have multiple auxes, essentially when you have multiple auxes, like let's say six auxes or eight auxes, I can, I can control each one of my aux to be a different image. And I can control those looks and get those things ready to go uh, so instead of me having to be switching it and, and preparing for stuff, I can control multiple screens all at once with one click of a button very seamlessly. Uh, and that's something that all the black magic have, which are very, very cool. And I'm a huge fan of the macros, huge fan of the ability to 
to network into multiple uh, computers into one machine and be able to have multiple people controlling it and help you, uh, you know, run a show essentially off of one uh, powerhouse. Um, and that's pretty much it, guys. We, we got one minute left, so we're right on time for that hour mark. Uh, the floor is open for you guys. If you have any questions of me, if you have any things you want to ask me. Uh, so I see there's a question here already. So how do we keep other people who are logged into the same switcher from accessing and controlling on the change? Oh, so you don't. So yeah, so you don't. That's, that's when you do teamwork, you know? You get the team together, you're all professionals, you're all competent, and you work as a unit. You make sure you stay in your lane, and that's it. There's no way to do it. Uh, I, I've done this before, something similar. Not with the Black Magic, but with an E2 switcher and a good friend of mine, Fuller. We did a switcher uh, with, the, with, the two, with an E2, Barker E2, and this kind of setup, and it was very much on headset communicating, uh, you know, communicating with the crew and communicating with ourselves. Okay, I got to do this thing. You got to do, okay, let me wait for you to click, and I'll wait for you to do that. Uh, similar concept, not as well as we done, but we did it, and it works out great. But yeah, you have to communicate with your team and be, be on point. Um, I will say, though, that from the, the, the quick demo we did in between, um, it does not affect anything you're doing on your, on your tab. If someone is logged in on a different tab, you don't really see what they're doing or what's going on, so it doesn't affect that at all. It only affects them if, let's say, he wants to go back into my switcher tab, and I'm on the switcher tab. Now we're both on it. We're both controlling the same tab. So if you're on, if you're on this page, and I'm on this, pa and I'm on this page controlling audio, I'm moving stuff around here. I'm on a, a separate computer doing my own thing that's not affecting anything that I'm doing on this page, nor, nor am I aware of what he's doing on that page because I'm not on it. So that, that's, those are separations of, of those tasks. Um, but yeah, I could essentially go for my audio and go to my switcher side and say, oh, well, he's not doing it fast enough. Let me just, let me just get him there. Let me just get him there. So anyways, that wraps up the fun stuff that I have. That I thought was fun facts to give out to you guys that I was, you know, if you guys want to get feedback on that, um, let me know if not. We can call it a day here. If you have any questions you want to ask me, you want me to dive into anything a little bit deeper here, uh, let me know before, before we end the session. If not, you know, thanks for being here. Thanks for learning with me. Thanks for, thanks for being a part of this. Uh, how do we get a recording uh, of it? So we, yeah, we just recorded this session. Uh, once this is done, we uh, don't do much editing on it. We're, gonna, we're going to upload it to the event page and to our AV Educate Facebook group. Um, it'll be there for the community and it'll also be on our YouTube page. Thank you. Yeah, hey, no Omar, I just want to say thanks. Really appreciate uh, you putting this together, um, keeping everything going. I appreciate it, appreciate it. And thank you very much. And, and just last thing before everybody uh, tunes out, I just want to give a, another a shout out to Media Stage here and the crew. Um, Guillermo Hernandez are in the, are Guillermo and Andres are in the back right now helping me uh, a lot of this stuff. They've given me this awesome setup. If any of you guys, I know some of you have been here before with me. Uh, this is completely 100% way better than what I usually do. Usually I'm in my, my bedroom or my, my office doing this off a, you know, a little GoPro and a little, uh, my phone plugged in. So these guys have, have gone next level with the production for me uh, for, this, this, uh, for this video chat for you, you guys. Um, they definitely helped me with a lot of things here. So I want to give a big shout out. Uh, if you guys haven't seen it, here's their information. Uh, these guys have been you know, nonstop since, since COVID. They're still in business. The doors are still open here and in Puerto Rico. Um, they're just killing it as far as the company goes. Uh, I found out uh, through talking to these guys that no one's been laid off here, no one's been furloughed. They all work together to make the budget works to make the loans work out. Um, this, this company's been just killing it as far as keeping employees on board, keeping freelancers on board. Uh, and this is a prime example of how they're you know, helping me out to help you guys out to just show how much they're, they're giving back to the community down here in South Florida. So if you guys can follow them, give them a big shout out. I appreciate that as well and help me out um, and hopefully help them Encourage them to let me do more classes like this for you guys uh, for, for bigger and better things with, with other people as well. So again, thanks for being here, everybody. Um, thanks for being a part of this and for looking at all this. Uh, yeah, and that's all I got. <laughs> you too, brother. I'm gonna. <laughs> I'll look into this LED stuff. I got a, a possible hog class coming up. I got an instructor I'm talking to right now. Um, so we'll see how that goes. Thanks for being here, guys. I appreciate it very much, man.